Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, I was here for the morning session in the back, and I have to say how impressed I was with these tips and techniques from people who've been there and been in the trenches. One of the things I really liked about they said was the importance of listening. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we move up the chain. How many of you are now or have been in jobs where in order to move ahead with being successful, you have to get permission or approval from somebody one or two levels above you? Could I see a show of hands? How many? All right, just, just about everybody. Uh, as, as Cheryl said, we teach speech communication at Redwood City. We travel all over the country. And we've been doing it for 28 years. The long about the year 2000, 2001, I had an opportunity to work with a VP of a San Jose company, the VP of IT, uh, on his presentations because he had gotten feedback that he needed some help. What I did for this person, saw him a number of times, brought him in, one of the things I said is be sure to use stories because stories are much more powerful than data. And there's a ton of research that shows that. So this fellow went up after he'd taken my class, and he had to give his quarterly report to the senior manager. So these were people who founded the company and the senior leaders of the company. A friend of mine was in the room, and she said, what happened is he started telling a story, like I told him to. And he gets into the story about 30 seconds, and the COO, who's in the back of the room, starts yelling at him, literally yelling at him. Bob, where are you going with this? Get to the point! <laughs> Now, now, Bob was not exactly an innovative and powerful and confident leader. And the person who was there and reported this thing, with, when that guy yelled at him, the fellow just kind of withered. He, well, the speech coach that you sent me to, Rick Gilbert, said to use stories. <laughs> at which point, the COO kept yelling at him and said, well, fire Gilbert and get on with it. So I, I was impressed with this story because it had been a bad day for me and for him. So I made an appointment to talk to the CEO on the phone about a week later. I said, so what went wrong? What, what, how did, did Bob blow, blow things so badly? And he said, look, he started telling stories. And we don't have time for stories. And I said, but, but wait, the research is very clear that stories increase retention. And then the COO said to me something, I mean, a light bulb went on, said to something that has changed our business from that day to this. He said, we don't care about retention. We have to get it on the table, make the decision, and move on. This is a decision-making meeting. But, oh my God. Speaking at the top level is really different than other kinds of speaking that we do. So we started investigating it. And because we had contacts with a number of senior people in Silicon Valley, I started doing videotaped interviews with CEOs. We sit down, they give me a half hour, have the video camera here, and I say, so what is it you demand from subordinates who come and speak to you? And these CEOs looked at the camera and they said, look, if they do this, this, and this, it's career limited. Do this, this, and this, and it's career enhancement. Now, if you're in middle management and you have to get approval, as all of you raise your hand, at some point you have to get approval. Wouldn't you like to know what was on this list? <laughs> and so we've continued to work on this with a number of publications and new videos that we have online programs. Uh, and Tess Stern, by the way, is our Boston representative, and she can tell you all about how you get access to this stuff. In addition to, uh, and Cheryl said, I'm, I'm not selling books today. I'm, I'm on a nationwide book tour, and I, I can't, I don't have enough strength to look around in my, you know, my, my luggage. So if you want them, you can go to Amazon, and they're on Amazon. Um, so, so what happened is we started researching this stuff, got some incredible insights, which I'm going to share with you today. And since way back then in 2001, we have trained about 10,000 people in these techniques. My goal today would be that when you leave, and let's say we have an hour, 45 minutes, whatever we've got, you leave here with two or three things that you actually can do tomorrow or next week that will make a difference in how you come across to senior decision makers. Because it turns out, it's like through the looking glass, folks. You get into that top level meeting, or maybe even just two or three levels above you, reality changes. Up is down, down is up. Everything is different. Why is it different? Well, let's talk about that. It's because of who the people are in the room. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about why I do this work. I have a social science background. When I see something going on in front of me, sort of a, something I don't understand, I love to do a little research and figure it out. 
So, so just what I've done for the last 10 years to get to this book has been really a thrill. To interview these people, find out what they're saying. But more importantly than that, we get to in our com country, company, in our company, we get, what was in the country? That'd be really great. Uh, in our company, we get to work with people who desperately need these skills. And it is such a thrill when you have somebody who's, you know, 35 years old, they've been in the business world for 10 years, they have an MBA, and they just can't get senior management to give them what they want. We show them this, suddenly, boom, things change. Let's look at what those things are. And uh, I'm going to give you, I'm going to start with the ending. So this is my summary. And, and then I'm going to give, show you again at the end, the summary. There are only three parts to this. It's very simple. Now, in the book and in our classes, we go down much deeper in it. But the takeaway would be, top line would be, when you're speaking to a senior decision maker, get to the point immediately. First 30 seconds, not five minutes, not after you've shown all the data. Because by the time you're showing the data, they're gone. They're on their iPhone, they're out of here. Number two. PowerPoint. How many of you use PowerPoint in your presentations? How many of you have heard the expression death by PowerPoint? <laughs> have you ever killed anybody with your slides? How about you've been killed? More? They don't want to hear it. Top level. The higher up you go, less PowerPoint. What they want is a discussion. Get to the point immediately, plan a discussion, not a slideshow, and then what key, what key? I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It has to do with improvisation. But they don't want somebody to come in with their slides and say, I'm going to give you my slides no matter what. They want somebody who's light on their feet to make changes as we go along. So let's look in depth. Number one, get to the point in 30 seconds. We have one of our executives that I interviewed. <clears throat> during the interview, he holds up his, his iPhone and he says, look, five years ago, these things weren't that great. We probably had five minutes to get back to He said, now... I have my email, I have the entire internet, I have movies, I have Oprah, I have Angry Birds, <laughs> and all of this is more interesting than your slides. And if you don't get my attention in 30 seconds, I'm gone, I'm out here. 30 seconds, boom. Here's a clip of the, we've, we've done a lot of videotaping of these folks and we've uh, used them in our training classes online. Let me just show you this one brief clip. senior people, they say, get to the point. Uh, any suggestions, any thoughts about why they're so urgent about getting to the point? Have you ever seen this gesture? What does that mean? <laughs> if you want to impress senior leaders, learn that gesture. Here, everybody, we're going to try it together. And I want you to lean into the table a little bit, and I want you to get kind of a really serious look on your face, okay? Everybody, lean into your table a little bit. 
and I want you to practice this gesture. We call it the big dog salute. So on three, you can say to the other people at the table, okay, one, two, three, hit it. And if you really want to go, <laughs> time is the big deal. It's just huge because they are on such pressure and they have more meetings than they can possibly fulfill that day. And if we walk in and say, how are the kids? How is summer vacation? You know, I read a book once on management that says I should create rapport. Uh, I noticed you have a sailboat on the wall, and I like sailing. Uh, <laughs> or your kids, I'm sure. <laughs> it, it can be very disconcerting because typically these people are pretty smart. They know the business at a deeper level than we do. And you show them the slides, and say, I got it, I got it, okay? Yeah, well, take me to the last slide. I got it, I got it. You say, what do you mean you got it? It took me three weeks to pull these slides, but I, I give it my best shot, and you got it. So it, it can be it can be a little bit distracting for the presenter. But if you walk in and you know about this stuff and you're ready for it, so item number one, get to the point immediately. Don't wait. We worked with a technical group in the in the East Bay, uh, the biotech company. And they always said they did their management presentations like a technical journal article. How many of you been, are scientists or engineers? Show of hands. So good, Sonny, okay. So what these scientists were doing is they were presenting to top level people like a technical journal article. So imagine an upside down pyramid. So here's the scope of the problem. Here's what other researchers found. Here's how we developed our sites. Here's how we analyzed our data, the statistical analysis. And by the way, 20 minutes later, this is what we learned. What do you suppose happens to the senior people after that gets going? They're gone, but nothing. So we said to these guys, flip this, this upside down pyramid, put it like this, start with your conclusion. You know what happened? They started getting the money. Senior management started listening to them. Just with that one change. But they hated it because all of their training said, no, I've got to use the deductive or index, whatever that logic is, so I can tell you how I got there. This is the logic that I use to get finding a conclusion. They don't have time for it. So item number one, first line, bottom line, we call it. Get right to the point. Number two, Fewer slides. Now, a number of you talked about using PowerPoint. And we've all seen this death by PowerPoint. And everybody laughs. But we found in our work with these senior people and the people who report to them, it's not funny. We have seen careers come unglued when a person, a hapless person who hadn't presented this level before, walks in with 30 PowerPoint slides and think they're going to make a dent in their career. All it does is damage their career. It's not funny. Senior people won't tolerate it. If you have a team of your own, four or five, 30 people, whatever you've got, maybe you manage other people, they'll put up with it. They have to. You're the boss. <laughs> but when we're speaking at the top level, they don't put up with it. So here's what can sometimes happen when it goes terribly bad. Um, so I'm going to be reporting on what we've um, learned on the, the presentations or the, the workshop we want to make, some about content and some about the financials. So first of all, let me, um, let me start with the, the content. So what you see up here is um, like if we do the same there, we should like do the same you know, on, on the other presentation. And so you'll see you got people, people, Presentation, presentation. And by the way, you guys can ask questions anytime if you want. Um, I, I think it's pretty straightforward, but you we need to worry about that. Stop it now! Stop it now! Stop! Yeah. Stop! 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 But you have But you haven't done that yourself, of course. You haven't put people through that kind of agony. But uh, it, it happens so often, it's just a shame. Senior people don't want it. They don't have, remember? They don't have the time. Uh, a friend of mine, great story about this. I, I like this story a lot. A friend of mine named Marv worked for Hewlett Packard. He was a lab director. And in 1990-91, in that time frame, David, David Packard came back to run the company because they were sort of taking a nose dive. And one of the things he did is start looking at these various programs to see which ones could be eliminated in order to cut costs. So my friend Marv went in with a big armload of overhead transparencies. 
Now, most of you are a little young to remember overhead transparencies. Anybody remember overheads? Okay, he had a big stack of them. And what do you suppose, and he, oh, he came in with his boss, by the way. So, if they walk in, he's real scared, he's been preparing for the meeting for weeks. And what does Packard say? He looks at this big stack there. Here's what Packard said to him. Don't bother with all that, just tell me what you're doing for my company. So my friend Mark says, well, my job is to take research from the lab and move it out into the division so it can be turned into products. Dave Packard says, sound good, keep doing it. At which point, my friend Mark, maybe we've been guilty of this, said, well, I've got to show you my slides. He starts fumbling with his slides. You know, show him his slides. So he worked a long part of the slide. His boss grabbed him by the arm and said, let's get out of here. We just got a yes. <laughs> so that's so typical of senior people. They want to have a discussion, they don't want a slideshow. Now that doesn't mean don't be prepared, and it doesn't mean you might want to actually develop some slides. It's just one point I said, if you have 30 minutes on the agenda, you're going to be talking for 10 minutes. The other 20 minutes, we're going to be debating. That is about three slides. So but for most people, a 30-minute presentation with three slides creates a rash. People break up a rash. But you just got to get used to that. They like to have a discussion. In fact, one of the executives that I interviewed said, look, if you can't talk about what it is you want or your project or your product without slides, then I don't think you know what you're talking about. And you don't get the money. It was that clear. Yeah, please. Okay, the question is, uh, it's really scary to walk into a meeting without data, and partly because you want them to know that you work really hard. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I'm not saying that this is easy. Um, and you probably should have all that data just in case they want to dive into it, because you never know. You know we have a link to the slide. But if you can wean yourself, first of all, realize that you're at the meeting because they already know you're good. They already trust you. So in a way, that isn't necessary. And I think what happens is if you're able to have a more high-level discussion, not get it down to the nitty-gritty. And, and, and by the way, this change, I think if you're, if you're talking to a lower-level technical group, you're going to want more of that. As you move up in the organization, you're going to want less data and more discussion. So kind of keep that as a, as a rule of thumb. Um, but just see if you can wean yourself a little bit from the slides. Um, now, I want to show you a little bit about so, so if we all agree that it's a good idea to reduce slides, and you're going to use them anyway, one way or another, let's look at some ways to do them effectively. Here's some fascinating research. This is in a book called uh, Brain Rules, and they, they quote a study, Picture Superiority Effect, it's called. They did a study, and they gave one group of people information using words. They gave another group of people the same information using graphics. And then they tested them three days later. The graphics people could remember 65% of what they had been exposed to. Pretty cool, huh? Now, so what we learned from this is make sure that you use graphics, charts, graphs, data, and it just you know, line graph, pictures. My God, pictures are so terrific as a way of keeping people engaged. And if we're just using bullet point slides, keep in mind, and the research on this is really clear from a number of different sources, the worst way to communicate, the worst way to communicate is bullet point slides. That's the worst way. And that's objective. Those are, that's in lab studies. Ne never mind what it's going to do to your career. It ain't pretty. Don't use it. Stop doing it. Uh, there's a guy at Penn State named Michael Alley. He has a whole system where you skip bullet points. You have a, a sentence headline at the top that says what the slide is about, and you use, you use images. So uh, let me give you an example. So let's say we're talking about leadership. Now, now here's a sort of compromise. So I've got my main points, but I have an image of a leader. This is going to help people remember it longer than the bullet points will. 
Now the question becomes, what should you do? How should you interact with the slide? Let me show you what not to do. As you can see from my slide, where should somebody do that? You're looking at them, you're looking at the screen, you're looking at them. What you want to do, I call it BTW. A BTTW, butt to the wall. You want to be back at the screen like this, looking directly at the audience. You want to be in the screen and in the slide. You want to be bleeding and puking and sweating all over this thing. And it's just, you know, you really buy into this thing. You're not, you know, phoning in the data from over there. So, first of all, I want to be right in it so I can take you through it. Then, you have to point to what you're talking about. So many times, somebody won't point to what this like. I don't know what they're talking about. I can't follow them. There are three ways you can do this. One, you can use your hand. Two, laser. Three, mechanical pointer. We're going to do a quick survey. Show of hands, please. Which of these do you prefer? How many prefer the hand? Show of hands. How many prefer the pointer? Show of hands. How many prefer the laser? Ah, those of you that prefer the laser, I have news for you. This may be a very big takeaway for you. Our research with groups right and left and all over the place indicates people hate the laser. <laughs> Don't do it. The only reason you want to use a laser is you're at a big conference and you have a 15-foot screen that's 20 feet away from you. And, and, and so I'm, I'm completely committed. You have to show what you're talking about. So it may be you know, that you've got your laser and you say, so as you can see here, the data shows, because you couldn't possibly reach it for this, but by and large, don't use the laser. Because people, why? Well, you know, people do this. You ever see, well, I don't speak a lot, and so I'm feeling a little nervous, but, uh, you know, so as you can see here, or then I see people, they get sort of, sort of lost in it. So it's kind of like, well, okay, so tough, yeah, tough, tough, really tough, minded, which he is, you know, you can see those faces, really tough, please stop it. Or then they forget they have the thing on, right? And the little light is flying around the room. Sometimes the pointer could be your best shot, but you have to learn how to use the pointer because people do weird things with pointers. Nervous? Well, a little bit. <laughs> I saw that one guy do this. True story. He gets up to speak and says, so, as you can see, we have high integrity, <laughs> self-inspiration. So, if you're going to use your hand, that's great. There might be a time when the screen is a little bit bigger, the room is a little bigger, and the pointer would work. Or last choice, of course, would be the laser. Any thoughts about that? Any, any, does that create some, some interest for you or what? Wait, you're going to talk about the video. Oh. Oh, good. Okay, we get the news of mine. Did you hit the button on the bottom? Oh, it's not. Did you turn it on on the bottom? <laughs> and, and your name is? Teresa. Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Welcome to the show. Uh, Question. My question is any tips for when you present remotely? Remote. Your teams are remote, virtual, virtual work. Okay, thank you. Um, how, how many of you have to struggle with this thing about speaking remotely, doing webinars? That's what it is. Wow. This has become such a big deal. We actually offer a class on it. And of course, we do it remotely. We do a virtual class on presenting virtually. Uh, and Tess can tell you more about it. But it's, uh, uh, there's so many people that are struggling with this because as, as nervous as I might be, talking in front of a live audience, at least they get feedback. With a virtual thing, you don't get feedback. You don't know if people are asleep, they're on their email, they went out to get a sandwich. So it's, it's really tough. And there are some things you can do. Uh, a number of things have to do with summarizing what you're talking about, using different people. Maybe you have somebody, a colleague that comes in to get a different voice. Uh, the don't use, don't use bullet point slides, don't use graphics. Um, and use involvement because a WebEx and a lot of these now allow you to actually break groups into, into groups. So you have, let's say you have 30 people on your call and you can break them into six groups of five and give them an assignment and they're 
rooms. They have these little rooms. They come back, even though they're all in different places and parts of the, of the country. But it just keeps everybody engaged. That's the, the key to this thing is engagement. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad you brought that up. All right, so let's continue. So we've, so far, summarized. Get to the point in the first 30 seconds. Don't depend on PowerPoint. You've got to be able to talk and get your point across without that. And here's the next one. Be improvisational. Now, what do I mean by that? The exec said that very often, business moves at such a pace that things will change from one moment to the next. You come in, you're going to do your 30-minute presentation on rolling out the project in Europe, and they say, oh, that's no longer important. Now we're talking about Asia, uh, and so can you give us some information about that? One guy said, sometimes these folks come in to our meeting, and it's like they've got their slides stapled to the front of their shirt. And they say, you're going to get my slide. The earthquake, building fall down, fire, I'm going through my slides. <laughs> That's not it at all, because it might be that something came up just a few minutes earlier. We're moving in a whole new direction. Are you able to change? And, and so in a minute, I'm going to ask you to think about a time when you've been improvisational in your business environment. So, so I want you to kind of think about that. I'm going to show you a couple of quick examples, and then I want to hear from you. One of our guys that we interviewed in Silicon Valley, a big CEO there, he said, 80% of your success is improvisation. Only 20% is content. And this might, you know, might fly in the face of what you were saying earlier about, you know, this content is like, uh, so what they're saying is they really want somebody who like can read the room, you know. So I've got, I'm, I'm like, I'm having an out of the body experience. Here I am, Rick presenting data, blah, 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 blah. and then there's another part of me saying, let's see, is it asleep? Are on an iPhone? These people are with me. What's, what's going on? And then if you realize that you're losing the audience, you have to do something about it rather than just talk quick to get the end and get out of there. So this thing about process, this is where the listening comes in as well. Uh, so you can start figuring out what's going on in the room and listen to the responses and then they can change accordingly. They cut your time. We just saw the clips of these, by the way. They cut your time. The, the executives just disengage. They start playing with their phones, right? There's a food fight. The key decision maker walks out of the room. You get the side talk, which we saw there at the end, and then they change the topic on you. Another one is when they get into an energetic discussion, which is uh, also hard, because you don't know what's the most important takeaway of the meeting. Now, I want to take one example of these. That's time cut. Because of our time constraint today, we, we just have this time for this one. So you go in, let's say you're expecting 20 minutes on the agenda, uh, and they, they say, well, you only have seven minutes, or five. Because the speaker before you, something else came up, we have to end early, you know, whatever it might be. What would be your suggestion about what you should do when they cut your time? Yes, please. Ask for a follow-up. Ask for a follow-up, yeah. That's what we call graceful disengagement. <laughs> so you say, you know, I really uh, was expecting a more time. Can I come back next week? Can we really do this a little further? Yes, please. So yeah, so so what can I give you? So instead of 20 minutes, I have five. You know, what do we need to focus on? Perfect. Yes. It, perfect. Yes. A lot of this business with time can be quite arbitrary. Now, I'm going to show you something called the elevator pitch. This is one of the most valuable things out of our program. Is how can you sort of boil down your main ideas into five minutes or three minutes? It works on the, in the elevator going up 10 floors when the CEO gets in and says, so what do you think about our new marketing plan? I don't know, no idea. You to, I mean, when you have your elevator pitch ready to go, you can handle this. Uh, even works on the phone. They're meeting somebody in the hall very quickly. So I'm going to demonstrate how this works, and then I'm going to ask for somebody to come up and give it a try. Uh, so this is an opportunity to practice. Right? So you may be thinking, I would rather shoot myself than come and try this out for the moment. Or maybe you're saying, hey, this would be kind of fun. I will say this. Whoever is that great person that comes up and does an elevator pitch for us gets your very own copy of Speaking Up Surviving Executive Presentation. 
sweeten the pot a little bit. So let me show you how this works. Tess, I'm going to ask you to be a senior leadership person. I'm up here talking uh, about communication, you know, speaking up, power speaking, all of that. And you have a you have a problem, a concern with something I've said. I'm not expecting it, and I'm going to see if I can use this model. It's only four sentences, actually three sentences, because these are repeated. Okay, so we're very happy to roll out our new communication training model. We think this is going to be very helpful to our organization. Any questions? Rick, can you please just narrow this down? We have about one minute. I just need to know why we need to do this. What's your point? So if I understand your question, is why we need to do this? Why is this important? Six, I can't. Why is this important? Why is this important? Okay, so this wasn't in my slides. I'm not ready for this. What do I do at this point? So the first thing I did was paraphrase the question and make sure I understood the question. You ever heard somebody answer the wrong question? All the time, right? <clears throat> my position is that our communication training is going to make our company more competitive. The reason that I say that is that in the past when we've given our engineering team communication skills, our profitability goes up. Let me give you a specific example of that. The Harvard Business Review last April had an article where they compared two companies, same revenue, same market, everything. One company gave their executives and, and, uh, and technical people communications training, the other company did not. And they followed the growth of those two companies. The one that gave them the, credit, the, the, the communications training had 38% increase in revenue in two years. So my position is communication training will actually increase our bottom line. Are there other questions? Now, this is the this is the heartbeat. If you've got a little piece of evidence, example, a story, research, whatever it is, that really nails it. So does anybody want to go check out that article in the Harvard Business Review last April? <laughs> I just made it up. There's no such an article. <laughs> but in real life, you wouldn't make this up, right? Because you would lock right on the line. Yeah. Probably, but not too much. I mean, I got the whole thing done in a minute and a half, maybe. So, you know, the idea is we get, we get, we get rambling. Think of these four sentences. That's it. But just don't start rambling, because then people are, oh, you know, looking out the window, they're on their phone. You, you have to really keep it focused and keep it. So, who's my volunteer who's going to come up and try? Terrific. Come on up. Come on down, as they say. So you stand up on the stage. Your name is? Stacy. We'll see. You were on the, you were part of the sponsor. Yeah, were they? So you're sort of a green one. I mean, you could do this stuff. I have to make a lot of presentations. Fabulous. Fabulous. Okay. Okay, give me the topic area you're talking about. I am trying to get the executives to buy in. I'm trying to get the executives to buy into funding a deal desk. Funding a place where our sales reps can go to get information that will help them win a deal. Okay. So, so you're talking about that. I'm in the audience and I'm uh, one of the executives and so forth. So I ask you this question. First thing, repeat the question, make sure you've got it right and then go through the four sentences. Okay. Got it? Okay, you're off. No, talk to you. Talk, yeah, no, talk, talk to the other interruption. So you're talking, talk to them. So we just got the voice of the field back, and what it, they're saying is our process is way too complex. Yeah, yes. yeah so this, this sounds really interesting, but I think I'd be worried about the cost. You know, budgets are really tight these days. How can you justify the cost of this? So if we take a look at... Paraphrase the question first. You're worried about the cost of bringing up the deal desk. Exactly. Answer that real loud. So, so my position, my position is. First of all, the position is we need to make sure that our field is equipped to pay more deals. The reason I say it. And the benefit to this is we're already spending this money across the organization. So what we're trying to do is consolidate it together and put a small additional PMO on top of it, and that's the only additional cost. Let me give you an example. When we look at what our competitors do, most of our competitors already have this in place. So if you look at what IBM has, we have sales reps who's just come in from IBM, and they have had this desk in place. It definitely helps the bottom line. 
so my position. Finally, I'm really here to get that support to put the PMO layer in place and bring all the different other organizations together in order to support our field sales people. Give Stacey a round of applause. So she kept it short. She, she had a good example. She knew what she was talking about. <laughs> if it does, give me the credit. If it doesn't, I never told you a thing. <laughs> so that's the elevator pitch. Uh, and it's it's a great way to handle it when something suddenly changes and you have to, you know, everything collapses, now you have five minutes. So think about that. That's in our book and it's also on our web page, so you can you know, check it out. Yes, please. So the negative, you'd be concerned about arguing for the negative? Yes, yes, I think this is a great, this, this, I, what she said was, could you imagine that the evidence would be the negative instead of the positive? Is that correct? Is that understanding? Uh, I, I think that senior leadership, if you, if you say, if your position is, I don't think we should move ahead with this program. And then an example is how we tried it last year didn't work. They might appreciate that because that's going to be cost savings. And you bring to the table that kind of uh, insight. And also, by the way, they found out that if you argue against your own position, it's very persuasive. There's a book out on uh, persuasion. And the guy said one of the things they found in research, the first thing you do is say, and I've really looked at the cost of this, and it may seem excessive at first. And so you disarm them by talking about what they're already thinking. I know we tried this last year, and I want to talk to you a little bit about how things are different. Something along those lines. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Now, let's look at this improv thing. I asked you to think about a time when you had been improvisational in your business in some way. I got a personal lesson for this a few years ago. I was, a, I was one of about 10 speakers that were previewing in front of meeting planners who hired keynote speakers. It was a hot summer afternoon. I walked in late, and I looked at the other speakers there that were, and I said, I know those people. I've got this thing nailed. No competition here. And I went over, swaggered over, and got myself a Perrier fizz water. And I sat down, I was up next. I sat down in my chair, and I'm watching the speaker. I'm undoing my Perrier, and it goes <laughs> all down the front. So I said, this is an improv opportunity. So it came my turn to get up, and my opening line was, people often ask me if I get nervous before a talk. <laughs> and that one wasn't serious, it was lighthearted. But there are times when being improvisational can save the day. I'll give you an example. We all, I, I have a dream, Martin Luther King, everybody knows that talk. Did you know that it was completely unplanned and totally improv? Very interesting deal. Uh, He had had the first part of his talk, about 10 minutes, approved by the Southern Christian leadership. And he got to the end of it, and the gospel singer, Mahalia Jackson, was sitting about 10 feet away from him. She had heard him speak a couple of months before about the dream. She leaves, she sort of turns and yells at him, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream. You watch the video of this, the notes go aside, he does seven minutes of probably the most impressive and impromptu speaking in the history of communication. Powerful. When he went to meet John Kennedy the next week, Kennedy walks across the Oval Office, puts out his hand and says, I had a dream. And then that speech helped shape the Civil Rights Movement and also helped Lyndon Johnson pass the Civil Rights Law. Very powerful. Here's another one. You all know Stevie Wonder, right? There's a song that came out when I was in my early 20s, it was, he was 12 years old, called Fingertips Part 2. The story behind it was, he's 12 years old, he's in Chicago, and he's the opening act for the Marvelettes. And the Marvelettes have a song called Mr. Postman. How many people know Mr. Postman? Mr. Postman. Well, little you know, 12 years old kid, he's out there having a ball, playing the harmonica, blah, 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 and the audience was really with him. And it was time for him to get off stage, like it will be me in a few minutes. So time to get him off stage. And, but he's having so much fun with the audience. You know, this, 
the interaction went on. His band is leaving the stage, and a new band is coming on. Well, he starts then another two-minute thing with the audience, and you hear somebody in the background yell, what key, what key? Turns out that's the bass player for the Marvel S. And they fill it right behind him. Listen to this one little clip of it. So that became the second number one record for Motown and the first number one record for Stevie Wonder. Totally improv, no planning. Powerful stuff. At your table, I want to, I'm going to give you two minutes. I want you to talk with people at the table about a time when you've been uh, off script in a business meeting, where some idea came to you, where things were different than they had planned, and then we're going to hear a couple of people talk about it. So you have two minutes. Talk with people at your table. Come up with one of these examples. Ready? Go. Stand up, please. Stand up. Rip your life. Get her name. Who, who, who are you? What's uh, My name is Jessica Lyons. I'm part of the MC. So, Hi. <laughs> so um, my situation was I, was I was new to a group, and we were working on a, a big project and, and presenting to some of the an SCP at our, at our company and his, his staff. Um, and it was a remote phone call conversation. I wasn't presenting, I wasn't meant to present. And the person who was presenting my boss then, um, his phone went dead. Um, and he was on vacation in Florida, so it, I ended up having to take over the presentation. Uh, he had changed the slides overnight, so I had no idea what the content was on the slides. So I had to kind of improv my way through the presentation and kind of make sure we got buy-in for the project so it had to be to work on in the next six months. So it ended up going very positively, but it was one of those situations we could have done either way. <laughs> so. Round of applause, please. Thank you. <laughs> That's a perfect example of, you know, just, just get improv at the time and, and boom, it all works out. So let's see. This table over here, an example from you guys. Okay, stand up. Here we go. Sorry about the mic thing. What's your name? Hi, Julie Saradin, also from ANC. Um, so I had a meeting recently. I was presenting um, to my senior director, and uh, I, I did the. You know, I started with the conclusion. You know, this is this is the recommendation, and um, he he just went like with the next steps into a lot of detail with that, which was good. You know, he was enthusiastic about it. It was a good reaction, but I wasn't really prepared to go into that much detail about the next steps just yet. And, 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 and some of it was within the scope. Some of it wasn't of what I was presenting on, so it was just kind of trying to keep up with that. So, so you had to improv. Right. 
had to go. I think the, the final bottom line was. Oh, yeah, I, I think it went really well. Yep. Um, and it, it, it was just kind of uh, trying to, to work in some of the recommendations that I had already gone over and, and just kind of build off of that. So. Okay, round of applause. Thank you so much. Those are some excellent examples. So I guess the takeaway for this would be keep that in your back pocket, the elevator pitch, the fact that you might have to do improv a little bit in the meeting, things change in the moment, uh, and, and what the executives are looking for is somebody who is capable of thinking strategically, thinking on their feet to the spur of the moment, and doesn't have to be always connected to the slides. So, when you're a presenter at this level, think about being a jazz musician or a stand-up comic rather than a classical musician. I interviewed a classical pianist the other day, and we were talking about jazz. You know, anybody knows jazz, we were talking about Bill Evans, who's played for Miles Davison. And he said, I don't get jazz. He said, I've spent my entire career learning how to play the little black notes right. Now, I have to love classical music but it's not applicable in all situations. Like when I'm landing at JFK, I'm not interested in a pilot who wants to improv the landing. You know, hey, hey, what's this, hey, Bob, what's this red button do? Here we go, let's try this out. You want, there's days where you just have to really play by the, by the rules. But speaking in a fast-moving business situation is not one of them. So that's the idea about being uh, more, more like a, a, a classical, uh, more like a, a jazz player. So I think what this book is all about is increasing productivity because meetings become more focused and at the same time we decrease costs. These executives are expensive people. They're very uh, impatient. They're very bright. They're ADD by their own admission. Oh, by the way, I haven't talked to you about how am I blanking the slide? You see this going on? This is the B key on your keyboard. This is maybe the most concrete, practical thing you'll get out of today. Hit the B key. Boom, slide comes on, hit the B key, slide goes off. What's the benefit of the slide going off to you as the presenter? Right, it becomes a conversation, not a slideshow. And you can get remotes to do it too, which is really, really pretty cool. So, uh, senior execs, the average executive stays in their position 23 months. Just in the paper today, I'm reading about Melissa Meyer at Yahoo. She's been there a year, no change in Yahoo's stock price. I'm wondering, I mean, Yahoo's had this sort of like HP, you know, the door's going. It moves so fast, they call it the Fortune 500. Maybe it should be the Indianapolis 500. These <laughs> execs are moving so quickly in and out of the companies, and they're responsible for a lot of, of financial gain. Do you know how much it costs to put five executives around the table in a meeting and have us talk to them? Let's say it's a four or five, six billion dollar company. How much an hour do you think that costs to put six or seven executives in a, in a meeting room? Wild guess. How much? Millions. A little bit less than millions, but you'd be surprised. $30,000 an hour to put executives around the table at a mid-sized company. It's as though the shareholders are buying a BMW every hour. <laughs> and what we found out in our research is these meetings are far from successful. 67% failure rate. So it's no wonder, you know, I've got 23 months here, and if the stock price goes down, I'm out of here. Let's make this thing move. And so if we understand that, we've got that position in mind, I think that we can be more informed as we walk into that meeting. And so maybe you're not talking to the CEO, maybe you're talking to an executive, uh, to a VP, maybe a director. Just somebody, their time is also. So if you start off by saying, I know we have 20 minutes. I think we can do this in 15. You're golden. That's it. I'm going to promote this person. They understand the value of our time. Now, one of the cool things about the book is that if you have a QR code reader uh, on your phone, well, I recommend you get one just because it's kind of cool. They're very valuable to have. But I want to show you here. Find one real quick. Uh, there are 12 of these QR codes in the book. And if you scan it with your phone, with your, with your QR code reader, you go to a video of the executives I interviewed. And there's 48 minutes of video connected with the book. 
So you can hear these real CEOs talking about all this stuff. So it's not just me, because I'm just sort of synthesizing what they told me. Um, so I think it's a good time to wrap up here. And I just want to summarize our main ideas. What does this mean? Huh? Get to the point. First line, bottom line. What does this mean? Dump the slides. Fewer slides. Don't depend on slides. And what key, what key? Improvise. Absolutely. Like Stevie Wonder. Here's my final. I'll leave you with this and we'll wrap up. I'll be around to talk. Anybody has questions about this, be happy to chat with you. Here's what a high level executive at Oracle told me, and I thought it really nailed it. Don't make yourself the lead actor in this play. You're not. Go in there quickly and concisely, deliver the information, answer questions, survive it, and get out! So my message to you is survive it and get out. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Get out! Get out! <laughs>